let's talk about praying for reco for the recovery community. I don't have enough time to cover all the information, but here, but or cover all the information out there on addiction, but let's talk about the basics. One of the documents we sent with tonight's Zoom invitation was the Recovery Coach Academy's five stages of recovery. Most of the clients we will encounter will be in stage one. So let's focus there. It states that the person in stage one should learn about addiction. They must know about the disease and what they're up against. They should stay clean and sober no matter what. This is obvious. They should undergo physical detox and stabilization. Now that's beyond the scope of this training, so we won't go too far into that or any farther into that. Uh, they need to learn to socialize in a group setting. And that's what makes the recovery center so successful. They also learn, they also must learn to break the pattern of isolation, also an integral part of the centers. They should develop role models for healthy recovery, which they can do by finding a sponsor with Celebrate Recovery or Alcohol Anonymous. Uh, anxiety management is also necessary and also beyond the scope of this training session, but I think Jesus might be able to help with that one. They must stay away from risky places, situations, and people relapse, oops, and people. Relapse is more attractive when they are, are around their triggers. They need to develop self-responsibility. And again, beyond the scope of the training. And finally, they need to learn to ask for help and support. There are many sources for help and support, recovery centers, AA, CR, and many others. But what source of help and support would you suggest? Who would you suggest they turn to? I'm sure we're all going to come to the same conclusion. Jesus, of course. Actually, Jesus could probably help them with all the items in stage one. In fact, he can help them overcome addiction for the rest of their lives. So please take a look at the other four stages when you have time. Like I said, this document is was uh, distributed to you. Um, so you can print that out, look it over because a lot of good stuff on there. Um, but there's a, a few quick bullet points that I want to get across. Uh, the first one is relapses, relapse is part of the process. Also, stage one is expected to take a full year. Stage two, another full year. Stage three and four will take them up to 10 years. Stage five will probably re re uh, last the rest of their life. And lastly, although the five stages of recovery does, does not say it, they will also have the risk of relapse for the rest of their life. And the last thing I'll say about the Recovery Coach Academy's five stages of recovery is that the best, best place for an addict in stage one to be is in a recovery center. Celebrate Recovery, Celebrate recovery and AA can help to supplement the center programs, but the best course of action in all these stages is praying for the help of Jesus. And that's where we come in. Before you begin to pray with them, it's important to know a little of the recipient's history. After you make them feel safe and let them know there will be no judgment, it is okay to ask questions like, what was your drug of choice? How long did you use? How long have you been sober or clean? And are you able to focus and think clearly? This information will help, guide, help to guide you on how much they can handle. Heroin addicts can have mushy brains for many days. You don't wanna read scripture for too long or expect them to understand intricate concepts if they're not with you. Keep it short and simple. Just remember that it's not your job to heal them if they're clear headed or not. Your objective is to bring them closer to Jesus so they can receive his healing. This is accomplished when you listen to the Holy Spirit and speak kind, simple words of his forgiveness and love. Don't preach at them or judge them. They love us because we love them. When I was asked to speak, asked to speak, like any good American, my first step was a Google search. Actually, that was the second step. The first step was me freaking out about being a minor league speaker playing in the majors with Tandy, Leanne, Lucinda, and Ken. Sorry, I, that, I promise that's the last baseball reference. I won't do it anymore. But 
So the second step was to search for things like prayers for drug addiction recovery and praying for drug, addict, drug addicts. The result, results were not what I was looking for. Half of the hits were for addiction recovery centers trying to sell a bed. A large percentage were for secular prayers to a higher power, which is obviously not listen, low, pray. I surfed, surfed the Christian websites looking for quotes or insights for this lesson. Unfortunately, none of them were worth mentioning. Then I remembered Listen, Love, Pray has a list. Duh! It's titled Checklist for Healing Prayer Ministers, Interacting with the Recovery Community. That document was also included with tonight's Zoom invitation. Hopefully you print it out so you can follow along. Um, we'll uh, I'm going to go ahead and share that. At least I'm going to try here. Hopefully it works. Share screen. And it's that one. Share computer sound. Optimize screen. And share. Hopefully everybody can see that. Um, so we're, we're going to focus on those that are unique to praying with someone in recovery. Prayer of protection. Number one. Pray the prayer of protection before the recipient arrives. Ask for an anointing pure love from ask for an anointing of pure love from Jesus. But don't be overly sympathetic. Ask the Holy Spirit to remove all judgment, condemnation, stigma from your mind. Ask for protection from demons or addictions and lying spirits. The prayer of protection is one of the most important parts of the process. We have to trust Jesus will protect us in the recipient. Asking for his protection with a prayer is a no-brainer. And that prayer was also included with your Zoom invitation. Ask two questions. Number two, ask two questions, touching and anointing. Men and women in recovery can be very sensitive to being touched. Some of the women have been subjected to abuse. Some of the men have been in prison. As always, when praying for someone, you must ask for permission. But it may be even more important to people in recovery. After uh, Number three, after listening to the story, allow time for recipients to settle and soak in God's love. When they tell their story, be aware that people in recovery will lie, even when it's not necessary. It can become second nature to them, a way for them to score their next fix or a way to protect themselves from judgment or abuse. Sometimes they will try to impress or shock you with crazy stories, but don't assume they're all lies. Some of our recipients have survived horrific circumstances. Number four, after soaking with, after soaking before beginning to pray, ask the recipient what's on their minds. Use their name several times during prayer. Ask, recipient, ask the recipient who Jesus is to them. Perhaps ask if they have a favorite Bible story. Do not make assumptions about their spiritual health or holiness. We will occasionally pray for, not, pray for non Christians and Christians who are struggling with their faith. Always attempt to find out where they are in their journey. If a recipient is given a vision, Follow those thoughts. Ask the Lord for revelation. Ask recipient if they can see Jesus or sense his presence. Allow the recipient time to stay in the presence of Jesus when they sense him. If led, offer specific prayers. Deliverance from habits, receiving forgiveness, breaking soul ties, lots of great ones. And the prayers that avail much. Hopefully you can see that. Thank you, Judy. Sealing what God has done in the prayer appointment. Number 13, send them on their way wrapped in the love of Jesus and escort them to the Lord. 14, cutting free prayer is another, another vital component when praying with people in recovery. That document was also included with tonight's Zoom invitation. When we pray with men and women, it can be very easy to get wrapped up in their stories. They may, there may be demons at work in their lives. The demons can attach themselves to us we need to command them to leave us and send them to the foot of the cross. We can protect ourselves with the cutting free prayer. Prayer minister Judy wrote, the men at Beacon House ask us to pray for their family members at home. We say, yes, what are their names? And then we pray. Often this allows the recipient to feel more at ease and open to sharing what is on their mind and heart. So Judy's point was a positive one. She is describing a method to connect with the recipient, but it also illustrates the need for cutting free. You will get to know them and their stories. Our compassion can lead to unhealthy ties to the recipient. 
The last item on the list is follow up with questions and concerns with Lucinda, Ken, or Judy. On the second page is things to remember. Number one, boundaries. Never lend money for anything. So just use that. What I do at work is I say it's company policy. I'm not allowed to do it. And that just ends it. They don't have, you don't have a choice. It's not an option. So tell them you can't. Uh, avoid giving rides to anywhere. If necessary, if, if in, for safety reasons or, um, I mean, just if, if somebody's stuck, if you have to, there should always be two people. And preferably one of those two people is the same sex as the person riding with you. Um, it's always smart to stay in a team and it is best to protect yourself. Don't let, give them an opportunity to make something up. So have that witness with you. Uh, don't give out your cell phone. They have Lucinda's number to contact us. All appointments with a male client in recovery will have at least one male healing prayer minister. And don't leave purses or phones or cash or valuables in, in sight. I mean, that cell phone can re uh, represent a few highs for them. Don't, uh, don't give them the temptation. Don't give them the opportunity. It's not fair to them. And you're not going to be happy if they steal something. Uh, two, don't get overwhelmed. People who struggle with addiction can carry a lot of guilt, shame, regret, anxiety. Take one session at a time, trusting that the Lord is working. Cut free, and if you keep thinking about the session, cut free again and give the client to Jesus. Again, any questions, concerns should be directed to Lucinda, Ken, or Judy. Three, scripture is powerful. Read and ask the recipient if something is in reading has touched their heart. Ask them if they have a favorite Bible study. If led, read it. Even if they didn't grow up in the church, most people know Bible stories from our culture. Ask about areas of unforgiveness. Take one at a time, only if the person is ready to forgive. Unforgiveness is prevalent in the recovery community and should be discussed when possible. They frequently hold grudges which hinder or prevent their recovery. Four, ask if they have forgiven themselves or if they have accepted God's total forgiveness. They may blame themselves and will need to forgive themselves before they can start the process effectively. Remind them that God has already forgiven them. Judy wrote, unforgiveness is a block to healing. I often find it is hard for them to forgive themselves. They feel unworthy and ashamed of what they have done. We affirm their identity as a child of God. He loves them unconditionally no matter what they did. When they feel his love, they can become willing to forgive themselves. Trust that God is working, even if there's no apparent change. Remember that God works in his time. Don't be discouraged when there are no immediate revelations. Rejoice with the recipient when you do have one. Six, allow silences. Try not to fill, or try not to talk to fill the space. Silence is an important part of healing. If you or the recipient is talking, it becomes difficult to hear the Holy Spirit. The Spirit wants to participate in your interaction with the prayer recipient. Don't be afraid to let the silence linger. Watch your recipient and their body language for signs the Holy Spirit is communicating with them. Prayer Minister Ken wrote about his body language observations. The recipient was twitching when the appointment started. As the prayer appointment progressed, the twitching stopped when Ken commanded the demon to leave. He also wrote of a big tough guy who broke down in tears. And that's a common occurrence um, when praying in the presence and the love of Jesus. <laughs> I've been on both sides of that, watching and participating in the crying. Um, that's pretty common. I was praying with the Beacon House residents during a private prayer appointment. I jumped the gun and interrupted a vision. The vision he had was of him flying like a dove. Of course, God made it work, and we were all blessed to hear his description of the flight. But we'll never know where the vision would have taken him. Remember, silence is golden. Seven, seek Jesus in his love. Ask the Holy Spirit for revelation instead of giving opinions. Do not chit chat at the end of the appointment. Allow them to remain in God's love. One revelation from God is more transformational than any of our human words. 10. 
encourage future prayer appointments. There is always more with God. And again, follow-up questions with Ken Lucent and Judy. Uh, so let's talk about Listen, Love, Praise history with the recovery community. We have prayed for Nathan's Ridge and Franny's house. We had many visits to the ranch in, Fred in Frederick. We have also been visiting my father's house in Mount Airy every week since the beginning of 2020. We have visited Beacon House once or twice every month for the last two plus years. The last, two, last few visits have been with Zoom. We've had mixed results on Zoom, but the one I wanna talk about is Edgy's. I'm sorry Edgy's not here tonight, but it was such an awesome, awesome um, lesson. So we always try and get different speakers because they don't want to see the same people. They don't want to see me every week. They don't want to see all the same people. So um, we'll reach out before a lesson and ask all the prayer ministers if they are feeling led to give a lesson. And uh, on this particular instance, Edgy responded very quickly. Um, the, um, I just realized I'm still on share. Let me turn that off. Sorry about that. There we go. So Edgy was, uh, was answered immediately and said that I want to talk about Noah's Ark. Um, she apparently had that story on her mind for weeks. And when I, when I sent out the email, she was, she knew she would be, was being called. Um, and then further later on, she found more, uh, confirmation from the Lord that she was meant to share. She's packing her daughter on her, getting her packed up on a move, on a, on a move out of the house. And they're digging through the stuff, digging through the closet. They find a box, digging through the box. And guess what they found at the bottom of the box? The book about Noah's Ark. So obviously this was the, this was the message that everybody needed to hear. So when we have these stories or when we had these Zoom sessions, when you're looking out, you're looking out at this big room and you see all these little teeny things moving around and those are the guys out in the room. You can't see anything. So when we're doing this, we're going to call them up and tell them to say their name. We make them really <laughs> tell them to come up and say their name and we ask them a question. Well, this time, um, let me back up a little bit. When we were doing um, the brainstorming to um, writing the meeting or talking about what we're going to do in the meeting. A um, couple things came up. One, we realized that the Beacon House is like an ark, that these guys are on the ark and the rainstorm is going on outside of them and these guys are protected in God's ark. So it, such a perfect analogy. And then somebody, I don't remember which one of us came up with the idea of the rainbow. So after the storm, what happens? God provides the rainbow. God provides his promise. So we talked about the rainbow and we said, okay, when the guys come up, we'll have them say their name and we'll have them tell us what their rainbow is. And when we start these meetings, we have the prayer ministers introduce themselves. And in this case, we said, had each person say what rainbow means to them. And then we bring the guys up to the screen and we ask them, what's your rainbow? So they're going through, some of them had some really good stuff. Some of them, you know, you, not everybody's comfortable in front of a camera, but a lot of them had some really good stuff. So while all this is going on, the rain starts. We're all, I think everybody there that week was in Mount Airy and it, a big old huge storm came in and we're all worried that, or I know I was, that we're gonna lose our interconnect connection, we're gonna lose our video, something's gonna happen and we're gonna be done. But no, God kept it going. And then Judy's sitting at her desk in the window, looks out and guess what she sees? Big old huge rainbow. And then I see Tandy jump up from her, disappear off her screen and she comes back a few seconds later, a rainbow, I saw a rainbow. And then after, of course, we get on, well, I don't do Facebook, but Judy gets on Facebook and she sees post after post after post of everybody seeing our rainbow, the rainbow that God did for us. It was such a cool story. So, um, and then the, the good news is that Zoom is over. We're back in person uh, Tomorrow, no, night after tomorrow, Sunday the 27th. Woohoo, LLP is in the house. So as you would expect, there have been some amazing stories. I shared the vision of Flying Dove. I've prayed with several grown street hardened men, just like Ken, who were crying like babies after Jesus spoke with them. Ask any prayer minister in our, on our recovery team and I'm sure they'll have some good stories to share with you too. 
So one of the, the best one I had was uh, we had a gentleman, I'll call him Bill for tonight's purposes, who told me about being taken to the woods by his dealer. Bill was trying to purchase drugs. The dealer was trying to steal his money. The dealer pulled a gun and threatened him. Bill believed the guy was going to shoot him whether he gave him his money or not, so he grabbed the gun. During the struggle, Bill got shot in the leg. The dealer took his money and left him to bleed out. Bill had to crawl out of the woods. He came up to a hill and began to climb up. Bill claimed to have no faith at this time, but as he was struggling to get up, to get up the hill, he began to pray to God, a God he didn't know. He described how he felt or how he felt the power of Jesus helping him up the hill. When he reached the top of the hill, he could see the houses close by and felt Jesus' presence in his relief. He ultimately found someone to call an ambulance and he survived. So I spoke earlier about the tendency for addicts to lie to make up stories that will shock you. But this may have been one of the, these, this may have been one of these fabrications, but the gunshot wound he showed us on the leg was real. And the story was just too detailed and, and he was, you could tell he was moved by the story. He was just, he, I don't think he was making it up. By the end of the prayer session, the tears were flowing. Bill began to quote, and you know, if I don't just throw this in here, if you look at our Listen, Love, Pray newsletter, you'll see a picture of three men praying. That was this session. Uh, Bill began to quote scripture verbatim, not just a verse or two, but almost complete chapters. It was <laughs> wild. Um, that was quite an experience watching the Holy Spirit work in Bill. Another individual, Albert, spoke of his childhood. His father played his part in the conception and disappeared. His mother moved in with another man and had children with him. The drug-using mother and father shunned Albert and favored the other children. He talked of standing outside the house on Christmas because they would not let him in the house. He watched through the windows as his step-siblings opened their Christmas gifts. He also spoke about the lock and chain that was placed on the refrigerator so he couldn't take any food. Albert turned to drugs as he grew older. He had children out of wedlock. He began to repeat the cycle. When he came to Beacon House, he started to turn his life around. Last I heard, he had a job at the Beacon House and was attending church regularly. Prayer Minister Lucinda shared the following. One Sunday night, I was praying for a new guy at Beacon House. He had heard me talk about the ranch and knew my son, Scott, from his time there. As I listened to Michael, who was 44, he talked a little bit about himself, but what he really wanted to pray for was his 14-year-old son. He knew how hard the addiction had been on his son. He wanted to ask God to bless his son, to heal his son hurts, his son's hurts, to direct his son's future. And so we did. And I realized yet again that the recovery community is just like anyone else in society. When we become parents, we're thinking about our kids. The love for family is universal. One way to connect with the recovery community is to ask about their family. You heard that earlier. And then listen and love and join them in the prayers they want to pray for their loved ones. Unfortunately, they're not all success stories. We lose contact with the residents after they leave the program, but sometimes we hear or see good things like the ladies from Franny's house who stayed with our program and continued for weeks and weeks and maybe even months and months. I'm not sure how long it lasted, but they kept coming to the Tuesday night healing services. Sometimes we see and learn of their failures. Judy and I ran into one of the men at a bar. He had just completed the program but it clearly fell off the wagon. We all thought he was on his way to sobriety. Another gentleman died of an overdose shortly after leaving the program. That was tragic. We have no information on most of them. We just leave them in the hands of Jesus. So in closing, I'll give you the recruitment spiel. Statistics, statistics indicate the pandemic has led to an increase in drug use and overdose. In response, Listen, Love, Pray hopes to partner with other facilities, but we need more prayer ministers. If you feel led or called to join the ministry, please, please, please reach out to me, Judy or Lucinda.
The reception we received from the res residents has been amazing. The majority of them are thrilled to see us. It is hard to describe the joy I feel when I see their faces and hear their comments of appreciation. Here's what a few of them had to say about Listen, Love, Pray. All right, let me see if I can share here. Share. Come on, baby. All right, why is it not on my options? Share screen. My name is Jim Green. I'm a uh, resident of the Frederick Rescue Mission. Um, the one thing I do love about Listen, Love, Pray is that every time they come, or every time I speak with them on Zoom due to the COVID or prior to that, and now um, they always bring me closer to Jesus. And one of the special things that I do appreciate is the way they pray with me. Uh, every time they pray with me and they put their hands on me, it always brings me closer to Jesus. And I love them very much for that. And I wish them to continue doing what they are doing. Thanks. I love, listen, love, pray. That's all I got. Hi, I'm Felicia. I'm a recovering alcoholic and listen, love, pray. Not only brought back some really amazing people into my life, but also they brought me closer to my higher power and I now accept Jesus as my savior. They care so much about recovery that they've helped me get more in touch with a faith that I've lost touch with over many years of my struggles. Um, they always have a positive message always upbeat and just want to have fun with us and enjoy our company um i just i i really look forward to seeing them each month i missed them while they weren't here hi i'm stacy i live at my father's house in mount airy um i met the ladies from listen love pray approximately february ish um they are absolutely awesome Absolutely. They have done nothing but bless my life in so many ways. They have given me an opportunity to have a relationship with God that I didn't know. And um, in return, I've been able to um, give that same opportunity to my kids who are, you know, from 21 to six years old. And until, you know, months ago, I had never prayed with my kids. And um, that's big stuff for me. Um, they're just absolutely great. They come here, you know, at our house every Wednesday and they pray and they give us an opportunity to, you know, read the Lord's word and to learn it and to, you know, they just, they give us so much of their time. And um, we're really grateful to have, you know, had this opportunity to be with them. Um, they came here when I first got here on March 2nd and it was live and they did it was about six hours worth of praying and videos and it was really touching um it helped me a lot and then COVID hit and shut everything down and it was a trying time but what happened they got zoom and that helped but it wasn't personal but now they're personal back live and it's just a great program great opportunity and uh jesus is alive thank you so i'm sure anyone who has served with listen love pray at the facilities will tell you the same the greatest reward is watching jesus work we would love to have you join us Listen, Love, Pray is working for Jesus. I don't think you'd be watching me, me now if you did not have interest in healing prayer. Matthew 28, 18 through 20 reads, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, 
go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. Healing prayer is an amazing thing. Witnessing the results of his work is indescribable. Taking part in that work is humbling. James 5, 13 through 15 says, are you hurting? Pray, are you sick? Call the church leaders together to pray and anoint you with oil in the name of the master. Believing prayer will heal you and Jesus will put you on your feet. You can be a church leader. You can heal the sick in his name. Are you ready to answer his call? There are many opportunities available with the foundation from providing healing prayer to education to sharing the love of Jesus in a community like no other. Please prayerfully consider joining Listen, Love, Pray in our battle with Satan in these crazy times. Please help Listen, Love, Pray with whatever gifts you have. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the presence of the Holy Spirit. Please help us to hear your message tonight. Please help us respond in a way that is pleasing to you. May you bless, listen, love, pray, and it's all in all its ministers as we serve in your son's holy name. Thank you for letting me share.